Welcome to Michael Myers Minute, where we delve into the 1978 horror classic Halloween one minute at a time. I'm your host, Robert Black. In horror film FAQ, John Kenneth Muir lays out the pieces of the slasher film paradigm. I'm sure we'll get to all of them eventually, but for now, the first two. First is the organizing principle. In Friday the 13th, for example, the use of the isolated summer camp as setting suggests the type of characters that will be involved, the type of weapons that might be used, and links backward to the second thing, which is the motivation or the deadly preamble, the crime in the past. In the original Friday the 13th, the counselors neglected Jason Voorhees and he drowned unsupervised. This opening sequence in Halloween is the deadly preamble here and the setup for the legend tripping of the Myers house in the future. For Richard Knoll, writing in Blood Money, a history of the first teen slasher film cycle, the deadly preamble would fall under the setup, specifically the trigger, the summer camp, the night of the babysitting. This is the leisure in Knoll's second piece, Disruption. This is a quiet, rural Illinois town. We can assume that this murder is far from ordinary in this place, The news of it probably spread long before the next morning's local paper made it to print. Everyone knew, maybe before they even went to bed, about the police cars and the ambulance over at the Myers house. Little Judy Myers, dead. And they say her brother did it. Isn't he only six years old? More likely, it's that boyfriend of hers, Danny Hodges. In the novelization, police detectives are said to have treated Danny very roughly and almost accused him of the murder. But the local magistrate concluded that Michael did it, and it was... An act of madness. Before Minute 5 gets going, I recently visited the filming locations, and specifically the Myers house, I found something new. I was taking pictures, and I went around to the side of the house, and I noticed, well, it wasn't nearly deep enough to contain the kitchen, the dining room, the living room that we see here. There were only two windows on the side. So I get to Googling, and I find a couple stories about Kenny Caperton, who built a full-size replica of the Myers House in Hillsboro, North Carolina. And I learned some history of the Myers House that won't come up in that bit about its relocation when I get to it in minute 13. The Myers House was built in 1888. Its original floor plans don't seem to exist. And more than its role in Halloween, it got its landmark designation because it may be the oldest standing residence in South Pasadena. The house has no bathrooms, or had no bathrooms originally, and no kitchen. And here was the interesting thing. And looking at last minute's walk along the exterior and this minute's interior, I should have realized the inside of the house is bigger than I ever remember the outside being. The kitchen was, according to Caperton, added for the film. And yet, I've never seen this mentioned anywhere else. Nor was the Myers house I remember from when I was a kid, including when the block of houses rented were all gone and the Myers house stood alone in 1987, as deep as it would have had to have been for the filming. Caperton added on to the back of the layout, putting a kitchen and bathroom back there. He made some building code changes, like widening the staircase. And instead of four small bedrooms upstairs, they have two larger ones. Caperton's version of the Myers house was built on over five acres of farmland and is quite isolated from other houses. After a year and a half of development and construction, he and his wife moved in in 2009. They even have an area in the house dedicated to Halloween and other horror films and novels. And you can visit it. You go to MyersHouseNC.com. You can find out information. But Minute 5 begins. The drawer is opened. A large butcher knife is withdrawn. The clock above the stove says it is 9.25. And then the POV swings around and moves to the kitchen door. Now, we get an IMDb goof here. In the opening sequence, after the young Michael grabs a kitchen knife from the drawer, he walks into the dining room and the camera silhouette can be briefly seen on the right side of the wall. Yeah, you see the shadow of the cameraman. The POV glides through the dining room. There's a bowl of apples on the table, candlesticks with long candles, and in the shadow of the chandelier there seem to be candles there as well. There's a nice chafing dish on the credenza, and yes, I looked that up because it's the 70s. I wasn't sure if it was a chafing dish or a fondue pot. Seems that the Myers entertain from time to time. The door to the right of the in the dining room, which we will see the other side of in the main hallway by the stairs, has a transom window above it. So does the door by the bottom of the stairs, and there's one above the front door of the house, although that's more normal. Transoms emerged in the later Gothic period, expanded in what's called perpendicular Gothic, and are more common in churches, cathedrals, not houses. 
The one on the front door, you might see that in other houses. It's mostly decorative. The interior ones seem strange to me. I'm not sure why the house has them. I mean, that's not about the movie. They just picked this abandoned house that was here in South Pasadena, but it's interesting to me because I don't get it. So the POV goes into the living room. The living room clock above a nice console television ticks loudly. It says it is 940. Did Michael freeze in place for 15 minutes and we missed it? This would mean that Danny is not as horrible a lover as we've all been thinking for four decades now. Maybe one of the clocks is just wrong. Maybe both are wrong. But we'll come back to the clocks next minute. On the floor by the TV is a toy fire truck. And there's a rocking chair by the front window. Second 26, Michael glances specifically at the empty couch before heading for the entryway. Because Judy and Danny have defiled it, perhaps? Because Michael is fighting the urge to straighten the throw pillow before he heads upstairs, maybe? Or because he knows what Judy and Danny started there on the couch? Maybe they have even had sex on that couch before. In the novelization, this night is the first and only time that Judy and Danny have sex in a bed. Also from the novelization comes Michael's thoughts. More detail than the film provides, or needs, but it's interesting. Quote, He could hear their sighs, moans, and giggles, and they filled him with murderous hatred. The voice in his head had become subdued for the moment as he listened to Judy and Danny, not really understanding the significance of their utterances except that it had to do with love. He had heard similar sounds coming from his mother and father's room, but he had felt warmly toward them. They were making each other happy, his father and mother, and that made him happy too. And why did he feel such poisonous rage against his sister and her boyfriend? It was the voice. The voice stirred up the hatred. It had done so in his dreams, and now it was doing so in real life. It had begun with the strange pictures in his head at night, pictures of people he had never seen. Well, maybe in comic books or on television, but never in real life. People in strange costumes, animal skins, armor, leather, drinking and dancing wildly around a fire. One couple in particular. They looked like Judy and Danny, madly in love with each other, dancing in a circle around a huge bonfire while he, Michael, stood in the crowd, hating them, burning up with jealousy. End quote. Not so much the mindless shape of the film. Instead, we get some of what Carol Clover calls the Slasher film killer's psychosexual fury. But if we take this version of things that Michael is being egged on by some voice, instead of the POV stuff I was talking about last minute, how so many times we are not quite watching the action from Michael's POV, but next to it, near it. This jibes with a lot of slasher film scholarship that would come later. We are the possessing spirit driving Michael to kill. We are there beside him most of the time, watching over him. Of course, in this opening sequence, we are inside him, but it's his first kill. We need to be more hands-on. The chafing dish in the dining room suggests some class. Like the Myers are well off, they entertain friends and neighbors with some parties. A decade later, they might be swingers. But by the couch, the floor lamp sits directly in front of a light switch on the wall. This feels low class. The similar to if they had a smaller TV sitting on that console TV in the corner because the bigger one was broken but made for nice furniture. The house is nice, though. I already mentioned the transom windows above a few of the doors, and the balusters under the railing, which we see seconds 32 to 39, are ornate. They're not simple and straight. The boyfriend comes down the stairs, buttoning his shirt. Boyfriend, look, Judy, it's really late. I gotta go. Sister. Will you call me tomorrow? Murray Leader points out that the film is already introducing the importance of the telephone to the lives of teenage girls. I would point out, as I think I may have already, or maybe I do in a later minute, that there's a timing issue here. Tomorrow's a school day. So, I would think, since Danny and Judy both go to the same school, they'd see each other, but oh well. Boyfriend. Yeah, sure. Sister. Promise? Boyfriend. Yeah. And he walks to the door. Another IMDb goof? camera shadow again. During the opening sequence wall and after Judith's boyfriend leaves, the entire camera shadow is cast on the wall to the left of the screen and on one of the doors leading up to the staircase. Yes, that we see the shoulder of the cameraman's shadow on the door frame, and then we see the shadow of the camera itself across on the wall by the stairs. Now, according to, I forget which comic, Danny would go on to marry Judy's best friend, Kathy Dreyer. Maybe he's haunted 
by how close he must have been to Judy's little brother and whatever fit of murderous rage had taken him over. The POV moves slowly up the stairs, and the minute ends. That is all for Minute 5. Michael Myers Minute is a production of Lemming Drops Studio. You can find more content at lemmingdrops.com. You can stalk me on Twitter and Facebook at Myers Minute or Instagram Michael Myers Minute. Or join our Facebook listeners group, 45 Lampkin Lane. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a nice review if you like what you hear. Until next time. See you later. Bye. Bye.